This is Rupa Moja, and I am here with the extremely talented and amazing author, actress, comedian. The list could go on, but that, we still have an interview to do, so I won't list all her multiple talents. This is the wonderful Mira Sayal, and we are here today to discuss her latest novel, The House of Hidden Mothers. <laughs> and it is her latest tale, and it has so many layers, so many things to talk about and discuss. But we only have a short interview, so let's start at the beginning. So South Asian culture tends to neglect surrogacy. It's not really a topic that's quite often discussed. Mm -hmm. So what drew you to writing about surrogacy? And also, how did you come up with the name for the book, The House of Hidden Mothers? Oh, well, um, <clears throat> well, The House of Hidden Mothers came from... Um, um, inspired by a documentary I actually saw, mm. which gave me the idea for this book, which was about a surrogacy clinic in India, and mm. I think it was called, um, I think it was called the House of Surrogates. Mm. And um, I really like the idea of. I looked up the, the meaning of surrogacy in Hindi, and it, there isn't really one, but it's mm. almost like the word for hidden. Well, so I thought that's quite interesting. So that's okay. where the title came from. Um, and the reason I wanted to write about this subject is that before I watched this documentary, I had no idea that surrogacy is one of India's biggest industries, and it's the biggest surrogacy industry in the entire world. It's based okay, in India, $4.5 billion worth, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's, a, that's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible. And a lot of the trade is from America. Yeah. Um, and I just thought it was such an interesting way of exploring the relationship between the West and India and also talking about a lot of the other issues I'm interested in, like infertility, like ageing, yeah. like women and their daughters. Um, and there's also a whole subplot, which I think is really interesting for a yeah. lot of your um, your viewers and listeners, is um, that the grandparents of... Uh, in, in the story have a flat in India yeah. that has been stolen by a relative and that's happened in my own family oh my and they spend years and years trying to get this flat back and I know this is a really common yeah. NRI issue as well so yeah, and as an attorney I was drawn to that storyline ah, too because right. I'm also an attorney so reading about the litigation process and the corruption and all these other layers that yeah. encompass this it seems like such a simple topic that oh, a relative stole your flat but the way you wrote about it all the layers you brought out was incredible so did you also have to research the legal side or is it because it, you kind of had the personal connection that you knew how the process would go yeah I just had to look at my parents records yeah. I mean you know early on in the book there's a whole list of about 15 things of various delays over the years and they are all true they're oh, yeah. all stuff that happened to my parents that is incredible yeah yeah, yeah. And miss papers mysteriously get lost <laughs> that's because you haven't that's you know. just like the money being exchanged and all that. And that's not something we really see as much. At least I like to think we don't see it in the U.S. So hearing about that and reading about that was really eye-opening as well. And I think you were talking about India being the surrogacy capital of the world. So do you find that it's ironic that India is the surrogacy capital of the world, but at the same time, Delhi is considered the rape capital of the world? And rape is also an issue that is discussed in the book. So there are heavy issues in the book, but they're all done in a way that gets you to really think about it and to be exposed to both sides so how did you really decide to combine those elements and what do you do what do you think of the irony about that I think it's a huge irony isn't it it's yeah. one of the many ironies of being a, a South Asian woman I find <laughs> that you know on the one hand we're goddesses and we're supposedly matriarchal culture and on the other mm -hmm. hand we are treated like second-class citizens and abused on a grand scale so it's one of the complexities that we have handed down from our culture but um you're right. I mean, all of those issues are touched on in the book because essentially all of those issues are about a woman's body and yeah. whose body is it and what right does she have over her own body. So I, for me, the two issues were very closely very linked. Parallel, yeah, parallel together. And I think coming to the point mm -hmm. about the issue of the feminism and, and your body and how it, who controls it, who owns it, I think also with regards to having a surrogate, what did you perceive the surrogate as, as in terms of how she catalyzes changes in Shyama, the main character's life, as well as the relationship between her and her own child? Because although the surrogate is carrying a child for her, it kind of brought her closer to Shyama, and it brought Shyama and Tara together too. So how did that play out in your mind when you started? Um, do you know what, as with all my books, I, I know where it starts and I know where it ends, but I don't actually know how the characters are yeah. going to get there. That is a bit of a journey you go on as a writer. And I was, 
you know, all this sort of subtle shifts of power. Um, that kind of just happened very organically as the characters started interacting with each other. Mm. Because I did think at a very odd position for a surrogate to be in, a woman who is, you know, generally at the end of the economic scale mm. and is powerless just for that nine month period is the most powerful woman in the world. Yeah because she's carrying someone else's child who's paid a lot of money for her to do so That's and right. the irony is that outside that nine month period she has very little value yeah <laughs> and that really impacts on you can imagine bringing a surrogate into the household of the couple that have hired yeah. her how that interesting that's going to be and i that's you. because then she's also also no longer the hidden mother she mm -hmm. was right in their faces all the time right. so i liked how that contrasted the title because when i started it i thought that the surrogacy issues would remain in india it would kind of just be a, a traveling back and forth but she's actually the one who changes everything the second she moves into the house more so than the baby it is her who's changing and man manipulating all the events in a way so i thought that was really interesting of you to do <laughs> And also then, do you see this book as being a feminist novel then? Because you bring up so many issues about the power struggle between men and women these days. Like We like to think that that was in the past, mm -hmm. but that's something that's still so relevant today. Like Even in the United States, we see that power struggle between men and women. Women are still earning less than men. So even as a lawyer, I know that 5% of women, I think, who are at the higher levels are earning a very low salary compared to men. Mm -hmm. So those are a lot of issues you brought in the book. So how did you see that? as you were writing was it a feminist novel when you began or did those issues did you did they just come to you as you went <laughs> I <clears throat> well all my books have been yeah. about the South Asian female experience yeah. one way or the other because I am one yeah. and I live it and I'm passionately <laughs> really interested <laughs> <clears throat> and I think because we are so overlooked often in yeah. mainstream media that we have so many stories to tell so that's and I think the politics of any good book always comes mm -hmm. through the characters. I never set out with a feminist agenda. Um, I always set out with trying to create the most accessible, believable, complex women I can. Yeah. But I think at the end of the book, if that's what you feel great, because yeah. that's certainly, I try and bring those issues out emotionally rather than in, in a very sort of didactic way. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> because I think even in terms of Shama's journey, she mm -hmm. gains power, I think, when she finally discovers who she is. And one thing I noticed in your novel is that a lot of authors, the second they introduce a character, they describe them in its entirety, the hair, the height, everything. But you introduced little snippets as we went. So do you think that was something that helped add to the realism of your book? Because it is a fictional novel, but I felt like it was, I was reading about people who I knew. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> that's a great compliment because yeah. I think, yeah, of course I wanted to go to make the women as real as possible. And um, Sharma, I feel I know, and I yeah. that she's a bit of me. She's a bit of all the women I knew. Marla was more of a, a challenge. Yeah. But the interesting thing about Marla was that she really sprang off the page. I mean, when I first started writing her, I wrote in the first person. She wanted to speak. Yeah. And I just think... I don't know, I just think sometimes, you know, for an author, a subject matter that really inspires you suddenly ignites a character that really works. And, yeah. and that's why you have to feel passionate about anything you start writing, because I think it's that passion that really helps them speak clearly and feel real. Yeah, that's true, because in, in this book, I think <clears throat> there's at least certain traits of every character that one can relate to, especially if you are a South Asian woman, and even the way they see themselves in a the mirror or the reflections they feel internally, I think those are relatable. So I think in terms of um, the way you contrasted Shama and Mala, they kind of seem to parallel the countries they're from, too, so the UK and India. So was that also something that grew as like you were saying that the more you write the more it comes together and even the nearby case that is mentioned was that rewriting it during this whole journey i heard this book took i think you started 16 years ago i read somewhere that this oh, it's no, been no. a while or so that it's been it 16 hasn't, years since my last since your last book, book. but okay so the, it didn't begin then it was no no this yeah. the idea for this book was about three years ago yeah. so it took taken about two years all in all plus the research and the writing yeah yeah so even the near pay case that mm -hmm. happened did you add that as it was coming or did it because it fits in perfectly into your novel too that was something that i thought was really reflective of our modern culture today because as a South Asian woman I think people are speaking up a lot more we see those demonstrations yeah, yeah. even in terms of media we're able to push it forward now so how did that come about then? Yeah. Um, 
I, when I started writing this book, I always knew I wanted to set it in 2012 for two reasons. One was that that obviously was uh, the year that Nirbaya's yeah. terrible attack happened. Um, but also it was at a time when the surrogacy industry wasn't regulated because yeah. I believe there is a bill going through Parliament now yeah. or that maybe is even in force that has begun to regulate the industry. So I always knew I would set it at that time. But there, there, there was no way that I could probably start a book without reflecting the nearby case yeah. in some way because it has been so huge. It's been such a huge, yeah, huge exactly. event for all and South it's, Asians. It's defined a lot of the South Asian women these days yes. too because that was kind of that one moment where everyone realized that maybe times need to change. Yes. Because even in this novel, um, you do write about the difference between men and women and even in picking the gender of the baby, Shama was a lot more open to it, but... Um, so we really wanted a boy, so that was kind of interesting how even in a modern society that they're still aiming to have a son. So do you feel like with this novel you might be able to change these traditional notions and at least open people's eyes that the time has come to really progress instead of hanging on to such traditional values? I think that's happening anyway. I think yeah. that's what all the demonstrations after Nirbaya's case showed. And we have to remember how many men were on those demonstrations yeah, too. True. That there is a whole generation coming up that really want things to change. They want to change the corruption. They want to change the sexual violence. They want true equality between men and women. Because, yeah. you know, why do men want to marry a doormat? Why don't they want yeah, an equal? Why don't, they, why don't they want someone that is as intelligent as them, that can make them laugh, that can truly be a partnership? It's also in men's interest yeah. to raise and date and you know encourage women to be the best they can so yeah. I think we're you know it'll take some time we have centuries of conditioning to unpick <laughs> but it started and I think this novel really is one to read if you really want to understand how the dynamics are shifting and changing and how women are becoming a lot more comfortable with who they are and their position in society, but also recognize that work does need to be done. So you've been in media and film and TV for such a long time. Do you see that shift changing in reality too from your own personal experience? Because when I come to the UK, one thing I notice is that there are a lot more South Asians on TV and you see them in prominent roles and as newscasters comedians, actors, everything. But back home, we're just beginning to see that shift, I feel like, because I feel they like have got further ahead than us <laughs> in a shorter time, because like you have the Mindy show. We yeah, still we do don't, have the Mindy show. We yeah. don't have a show headed by a South Asian woman in this country. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have, um, you have Asian actors winning Emmys. Yeah. You know, Archie Punjabi and The Good Wife. That's true. You know, we look at you and go, boy, you've you've really overtaken us. So it's funny how the perception is. <laughs> I think that it's, it's interesting, then, how the perception that we have in the U.S. is that the U.K. has been so much more progressive. <laughs> because I think maybe in terms of numbers, it's you turn on a channel like EastEnders or Kumar or Savazan, yeah, right. and you do see more of a population, and it's not a stereotype, because the way a lot of artists are still portrayed there is you do the Indian accent, and right. we've seen that shift more so with Mindy's show. So yeah. I think she has been that person who's ch causing change here in the U.S. too. Yeah. So do you think that this book you're going to be able to promote it the same way as here, in the sense that if the U.S. isn't as familiar with South Asian culture as U.K., yeah, yeah. is your tactic going to change with regards to that? I think it'll be, yeah, it'll be more of a challenge. I mean, yeah. obviously I'm more known here, yeah. although I am appearing on a big series on HBO soon ah, called awesome. The Brink <laughs> with Jack Black and Tim Robbins. So that might, yeah. That's, I, I think, think, think that will definitely earn you an Emmy. I'm going to call it right now. I think uh, Mira Sayal is going to win the Emmy for that. <laughs> not, not with the size of role it is. You know, it's my <laughs> first ever job in the States, but um, I was lucky. All my scenes with Jack Black, so that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be slightly more different. Uh, I don't think more difficult, maybe, because I think because surrogacy is such a hot topic in the mm -hmm. States and because um, my other two books were only set in Britain, but this one is set in India as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the US audiences seem to understand India more weirdly yeah. than British <laughs> Indians yeah. so I think that it's a lot more accessible this book than the last two so I'm hoping you know American audiences will take to it too. So what do you feel about the stigma that's still associated in South Asian culture with using these non-traditional means because do you feel like yeah. that's something that people really need to open up to and speak out more about because I think even if some of the stars like Shah Rukh Khan recently used a surrogate sure. and that's bringing him back to the limelight mm -hmm. so what do you feel about those issues? 
Well, you know, the fact is, it, it you know, not only is it going on, but India is the world centre for surrogacy. So it's yeah. kind, of, kind of crazy it's not being yeah. discussed because I think it, it's totally personal. I think that really still ties into the novel as it being hidden. So exactly. I think this is something that will bring it out a lot more. And also in terms of your other projects, besides this book, um, what are you working on that we can share with our readers? So we have the HBO project. We have this book coming out. And then are you on, I heard you were doing Broadway too, like recently. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Really? Oh, great. Someone... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Adding in all these rumors and adding your own. <laughs> no, I've just finished a, a long run at the National Theatre yeah. in a play. Um, I may be doing another play in the autumn. I actually don't know right now, actually, yeah. what, what is next. I have been working pretty constantly for yeah. a year and a half. So, so maybe a vacation in the U.S. is you <laughs> Take I'm going to take the summer off and then I'm going to see in the autumn. Yeah. So one last question for you. What is the one takeaway message you hope everyone gets from reading your book? Um, wow. I think that, you know, every issue that you think is black and white is really not. Yeah. It's shades of grey and it's yeah. complex. And I hope after reading the book you will really have got in, inside the heads of two really extraordinary women. Yeah. Definitely, that's wonderful. And thank you so much for granting us this interview. You've been one of my favorite interviewees so far thank because you. you're so wonderful and intelligent and amazing. And thank you for being a role model for those of us in South Asian media and culture too. So thank you for everything. Thank you, my pleasure. <laughs> thank you.